Hello and welcome back to 10 Cast. My name is Johnny. We're here in Studio 10 and today we're joined by the amazing Simon Marion. Thank you. That's uh, it's a nice change. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice change to have you here. I mean, that sounds really bad for everyone else that comes in the room, but you know, you have been, I would say, quite massively our most requested guest to come and get on a podcast, tell your story more. Ever since we did our live event, I mean, back in, don't even know what month it was. I can't remember, actually. Months ago. It was in the summer. Yeah, it was months, several months ago. People are still asking me today to either put out a podcast so that we can tell your story or when's he doing another event? When can we hear it? So this is for those people. It's also for me because I enjoy speaking with you. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully if you're listening to this, you can see why so many people are keen to hear Simon's story because I certainly, I know I am. Well, um, either uh, a lot of people with sheltered lives and a desire to get to sleep quicker, I think that's probably what it is. <laughs> <laughs> So I actually had that experience with um, a local journalist. I won't say who, because it sounds like I'm taking the mick out of them, but they, they did an interview with me about the business. And they said, like, I didn't think this was part of the interview. I thought we were just chatting. And I've now realised you're never just chatting with a journalist. Uh, no. But they said, um, you know, how, how often do you listen to podcasts? And I said, to be honest with you, I work on them all day. So normally if I am going to listen to one, it's in bed at night when I'm going to sleep. Mm-hmm. And the article goes out and it read, obsessive podcast host cannot fall asleep without a podcast on every night. And I'm like, why? Okay, you've really made me look good there. Like it was, uh, my friends and family saw it. They were like, you sound like such a geek, like a horrible, obsessive. So here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Making yeah. a podcast that someone will no doubt be listening to in bed at night. Probably me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm happy to assist in somebody acts all over. I don't mind. <laughs> so anyway, enough about me. This is all about you and your story. Um, for the listeners, I would like to preface this by saying I know your story, or at least parts of it, because this is yep. not the first time we've worked together. Um, we've done live shows talking about it, and also we've produced amazing podcasts with yourself and Steve Beattie, uh, the Wounded podcast, as well as people like Vic Baxter. You know, we've... We've worked together. So yes. I don't want people to think I'm pretending not to know your story. But in my role today as trying to help people who don't know you find out, I'm going to ask questions that I sort of already know the answer to. Um, along the way, we will obviously touch on things that I haven't had the chance to ask you yet. And this is my opportunity to. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to say that so that people don't think, well, he already knows that. Why is he acting like he doesn't? There'll be things here that I'm asking a loaded question. But there will also be plenty of times where I'm like, this is new and this is fun. And that's the beauty of a, of a podcast. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Just wanted to make people aware of that. Now, as we go into it, I thought to myself, how do I start this? Because it feels weird when I know <laughs> it's a bit like rereading a book you've already read, but you know yeah. there's chapters you've missed. So I okay. thought, I'm going to put that in your hands and say, what is it about you that you think people are most surprised to learn uh after they get to know me how the hell am i still here um i think probably what we're talking or you mentioned earlier is you know being kidnapped three times is kind of unusual uh it was very unwelcome um but it is unusual and people are i'm still surprised to be quite honest so i don't I'm not. I'm not surprised that other people are just as surprised. A lot of surprises there. Um, <laughs> sure, but you know what I mean. And for those that are listening to this, going, "Whoa, that kind of ramped up suddenly." <laughs> let's work back from that and reverse engineer it slightly. Okay. So you were kidnapped three times, and yes. we will get to that. But how and why were you kidnapped? What was your? Who are you? Prior to that, you know, who is Simon Marion? Okay, so I started my working life properly in the Royal Marines as a boy soldier. Um, and I did the usual stuff that everybody wants to do in the Marines, went on every tour possible, did every, did jungle, did desert, did Arctic, um, did all the, the shipboarding stuff and uh, Mediterranean cruise, Mediterranean cruises on her, <laughs> what was Her Majesty's Grey Funnel Line, now His Majesty's. Um, so I did, 
I did pretty much everything and went to Northern Ireland. I did went all over the place, did loads of stuff. So, um, and I, in the latter part of my career, um, and after I left, I was focusing on, uh, human intelligence work, um, which was for a variety of organizations and, um, some different industries as well, because I worked in the kind of the, the corporate side, utilizing those skills in various ways. Uh, and all the while along the way, studying psychology and um, utilizing the skills from the human intelligence side, latterly in, in the therapeutic and coaching. So along the way, after I'd left the military, I was medically discharged. Uh, I then was in the position where I was in in Nigeria, working in Nigeria, and I got kidnapped. And they said got killed twice. I thought, <laughs> Do you know, it's funny you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I can confirm I, I've not been killed. It's funny you say that because in some way, and I know that this might seem like I'm overthinking it, but in some way from what I've learned from you, it's almost as if you were. Each of those experiences, bar maybe the first one, Although in some way, I still think the first one seems to have rebirthed you slightly. The, the first, the first one is quite comical looking back on it, really. And even in the in the in the moment, once the once the dust had settled, and we knew, kind of, I knew I wasn't going to, I wasn't knew I definitely wasn't going to get killed. It was it was actually it was just kind of a little holiday, really. It was just as bizarre as that sounds. It's totally kind of contradictory to what most people might think, but. I think that's that, a safe assumption. Yeah, yeah. I, I never expected to have a kidnapping quite like that. Um, well, I never expected to get kidnapped, to be fair. Uh, the second one was definitely, yeah, that 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 was very, that was different. And the third one, although it was it was hours rather than days, was was by far the scariest, I think. And so, I feel that today I'm going to try to. You often speak in language that I think. It impresses me, but it also scares me that you you have a knack for making everything sound like it was nothing, like it was yeah, that was a holiday, yeah. or it was that was pretty bad. You know, you're you're like the most stiff upper lip guy, in that yeah, that happened. That was that was a bit of shit. But actually, we're talking about some of the well, the way I described it earlier off camera was like some of the worst of what humanity has to offer has happened to you more than once. Yeah. Um, and I feel like part of what I'm going to try to do today is decode that for a listener who, if they don't know you, they're hearing this thinking, they say he got kidnapped, but it sounds like he maybe just got kind of, you know, held at the airport security for a bit. And it's like, no, that's not what happened here. Um, and your way of putting things is very admirable, but also very, I wonder if it's part of how you cope with it to actually downplay everything you know and make it sound oh, that was that was a bit rubbish um oh for sure i mean to get me wrong the, the the military has a very dark sense of humor mm -hmm. and the dark sense of humor is what gets you through the shitty times yeah you know those really close call cool moments in 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 it, at work when you're at the sharp end of it it definitely helps you get through it no shadow of a doubt so downplaying it is part of that process of of kind of helping to process it and make sense but equally now I can talk about these things so freely because they are, you know, they're not, they're done, dusted. They're yeah, it's all filed away and, you know, I know they're not going to happen again because I'm, A, I'm not going to be that bloody stupid a fourth time. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <clears throat> well, yes, yeah. Touch wood. Touch wood, yeah. Um, but it's... It, it's that's just the fact that it is it's, it's something from the past that I can talk there's no emotional connection to it now I can't imagine that that's no. that's you know it's it's done dusted and what what's in the past can't do anything to you so you know hey yo I could have a laugh at my expense being a complete fucking idiot you know I think that's a really admirable and strong way of looking at it um when you describe that compartmentalization mm. it's in the past it's not happening right now and it's there's no longer an emotional connection mm. to me and we've spoken about this before yeah knowing that you're i think the only survivor or the only person still alive today from one of those kidnappings mm -hmm. i can't help but wonder and obviously we sadly would never have the chance to ask you know 
the other victims of that. Yeah. If that's the factor that leads to you still being alive, that disconnect, you know, between that experience and today, you're no longer living in it every day. Um, yeah, I mean, I did for a while. Obviously, it's perfectly natural to to take some time to to make sense of it because it's you know, it's it's pretty shit when it's happening. Uh, it's really yeah, yeah. That was a hurty lot mm -hmm. as was once described. <laughs> Um, but it, it does play in your mind, you know, and you, you wake up in the night yeah. sweating like a bloody racehorse, not sure where you are and wondering, you know, who who's lying next to you and why is that person that was standing over me just now completely gone and why is there a mirrored wardrobe door there? You know, that sort of right. weird shit that plays through your head because you're trying to yeah, rem process. remember where you are when you've woken up in the night having dreamt about it again. I don't, I don't get any of that now. And so I guess to, to go back, cause there will be people listening to this that still don't really understand what's happened. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing I'm going to decode slightly for people, because this threw me when I first met you, Okay, was you described things as human intelligence. Yes. And I thought <laughs> this is embarrassing. I naively thought that was like a form of HR. Okay. You know, which because I, I thought human intelligence, human resources m must be the same thing. There's a, there's a, there's a wee link. Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, my side of the human intelligence piece was recruiting people, convincing people to come and to either give information or uh, come and work, you know, for the organization that I was working for um, to work with them in some capacity. Uh, so that was that was my job. So it is you know it was recruitment, um, just not in the <laughs> not in the corporate sense. Not in the corporate sense. No, for a slightly different. And I guess the word that most people would use for that line of work that immediately makes sense is spy, right? Yeah, yeah. People can call it what they like. Yeah. And that's kind of, in some way, I don't like to throw that word out too easily because now I'm aware of the. I guess the depth of what you did and it's not it's not James Bond, you know, no, not at all. blowing things up and running away. It's also not just the nice bits. It's really it could be hiding in rubbish for several days at a time. Oh, there's yeah, there's also, you know, you'd be <sighs> trawling through people's bins looking to see what mail they've thrown out, following them, you know, if they if they live rurally, you know, you could be in a hedge or a car, uh, or a van, or whatever, for days on end, and you, you, I could spend months surveilling people to pick up their pattern of life. You know, you do, you surveil them for as long as you need to to get that information, to get that pattern. And for some people, it takes longer. Right. And if you're, if it's somebody who is, has some level of training or is aware, whether it's naturally or through some training, then it takes longer because you have to be more careful. Um, with with you know ordinary run of the mill person who's got no awareness, no training, no nothing, no experience of any of this, and has no idea that they're being surveilled, right? Then it's easier because it, it you know you can get a lot closer, typically without the fear of being Detection. compromised. Yeah, so um, it's a it's a case by case basis. And when you described that, you know, earlier you mentioned kind of even doing that in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. Um, the word I've heard a lot of people use for that is corporate espionage as an industry, right? Yes. Which I'll be, again, completely honest, when we first met, I'd never even heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> goes to show if anyone's doing corporate espionage on me, I'm a fucking perfect target. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even, didn't even know it was a thing. I'd be like, yeah, sure, you can come in and look at everything. So I'm assuming you've looked it up now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, come and take a picture. Great, put it on Instagram. <laughs> you know, I'm really probably easy pickings for someone like that, but... What is corporate espionage and what purpose does it serve for the people that either hire someone like yourself or prevent against someone like yourself from operating? What's what's the goal? It's is to is it's for it's information gathering. It's to gather information on competitors uh, to get the upper hand to understand what they're doing if they're ahead of the game 
or if there's something, you know, there's been a leak of information or just through other sources, a company has found out that one of their competitors is ahead of them in the in the game that they're in in what they're doing as a as a business, then they want to find out what's going on and, and how they can get that information to then gain the upper hand again. So that could be anything from intellectual property, you know, like Absolutely. maybe a, a patent or a, a development yep. that's not quite been protected yet and how you can maybe beat them to that or yep. steal it. Plans, drawings, and then coding. Right. Yeah. So software and things. Mm-hmm. Could it border into things um like a personal life, you know, if you if you've got an enemy or, or enemies, not a nice word. I'm getting a bit militant now, but you know, competitor, <laughs> competitor, <laughs> competitor yes. is probably the appropriate term. Mm-hmm. Would it go as far as trying to find dirt on that person to try and you know give them yeah. a distraction? A bit or? like politics, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're always constantly trying. Well, not constantly, but the companies that do operate in that manner are are always looking for ways to gain the upper hand, right, and gain the advantage. And what might that look like for someone like you? How how does that go? You know, if you're tasked with that, it's very similar to to the other. Side. You know, human intelligence gathering intelligence on human beings is about surveillance, right? Uh, trawling through bins, potentially um, gaining access to people's properties and businesses to get information, utilizing other other people in in a uh, in teams. So you've got a decoy team will go in. You'll have a props team who will act as um, cleaners or maintenance engineers or what, whatever, how, whatever route you want to utilize to gain access uh, and decoy teams to, to, to distract attention so that you can do things. You can do a lot in plain sight. You know, it's the sleight best of disguise, hand, isn't it? magicians, sleight of hand. It's, it's where you it's that misdirection by pushing somebody's attention in a different direction while you do the thing right under their nose. Right. That's really what's going on. And that's more effective than, you know, zip lining in and... Oh, God, like yeah. Tom Cruise yeah, yeah no, no, no Mission Impossible stuff. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I know. I never got involved in anything like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and Too much bloody hard work. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so... In the world of that kind of corporate espionage, as well as the normal, or I say normal, surveillance work, this is one of the questions I've wanted to ask you but haven't yet been able to. Okay. If you're working on behalf of another company, to an extent you're working within the realms of the law. Yes. Right? And you, you would always try to, in the same way as like a private investigator, let's say. But of course at times you have to maybe, let's use the word bend the law or try to do things in a gray area, right? In a scenario, hypothetically, if you were to break the law, you know, let's say access a property that would be trespassing or something like mm-hmm. that, what happens to you? Are you essentially the the fall guy who just, you take it and you get arrested and that's it? Or does the company then get involved? What, what does that look like? If you get caught doing something you shouldn't, what happens? You get in the world of shit. <laughs> Bottom line, yeah. Yeah, no, there's no the buck stops with you. So whatever you do, however you operate, has to be within the confines of the law. Yes, boundaries are always pushed, um, and there's flexibility within the law to a degree. Uh, the law is open to interpretation, like like any sort of rules and laws and guidelines. Uh, but yeah, you have to operate within the confines of the law because you just otherwise you you set yourself up. Because you can't trust. Yeah. You cannot trust the people you're working for or contracted by. To, to protect you. To, to protect you at all. You can't trust them to, to have your back at all. That's quite a scary thought because on one hand, I thought you were going to say you can't trust the people you're spying on or, you know, whatever. And I thought, well, yeah, that makes sense. But actually, when you say you can't trust the people you're working for... In a weird way, that's a very isolated place to be because Hugely. you can't trust the person hiring you. You can't trust the person you're, you know, gathering intelligence on. You can trust yourself. You can't even necessarily trust the police. No. So that must be quite a lonely place. It can be. Yeah, yeah, it can be. It's uh, 
in some ways, in, in some ways, it's it's kind of nice because you operate under your own values because that you're not being controlled. Excuse me. In terms of how you deliver, you're given a, an objective, and it's up. It's down to you to plan it, and then achieve that objective. How you do that? They're typically not interested as long as it doesn't put them. It doesn't compromise them in any way, shape, or form. Right. Uh, because that that you know they will drop you like a hot rock, and they will drop all that crap on your shoulders. Yeah, we don't know who that guy is. Yeah. Right. And so with that kind of bringing me and hopefully some of the listeners up to speed on what you do and how isolated you are, let's go back to where you were with that first kidnapping. Okay. To an extent, where were you and what happened? Okay, so I was in Nigeria. God, excuse me a second. I was working in Nigeria and... Myself and one other chap were kidnapped. We were in um, the arse end of the Niger Delta. It's like uh, a swamp, right? It is. Yeah, it's all it's it's swamp and mangrove swamps and jungly kind of area. I mean, it's quite beautiful in its own way, um, but there's there's the all these massive rivers and tributaries and etc. And we got taken up a river to God knows where. <laughs> Absolutely in the middle of the night. No idea where. Uh, you know, you get taken at gunpoint, no weapons on me or this other, you know, we had no weapons. Uh, and you get half a dozen, no, sorry, a dozen or more, depending, it was like three or four boats of people. Um, and they take you and it's a very persuasive argument when you get, you know, surrounded by people with weapons and you've got nothing but, you know, yeah, your hands. Yeah, bad breath and foul language, really. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so at that moment, where obviously you're in the Niger Delta, but where are you physically? You know, are you in a in a pile of mud? Are you stand are you walking around? What when we get physically what's the what does that look like? Well you get we we got taken by boat up this river for, for about two and a half hours. Then we got uh, we were hooded and uh, we had a, basically a, an old sack chucked over our heads, laid face down at the bottom of this boat going up the river. And then when we got out of this village, it was uh, it was just about, you know, starting. Be, dawn was uh, was on its way. And, uh, yeah, we just got taken out and they took the hoods off. They untied us. And they went, listen, guys, don't worry. We don't, we, nobody wants to hurt you. We're not, the reason we've taken you is because we can use you to for ransom for money and also we can use you as a political statement to the government and to the oil companies. Right. That was all it was about. They were pissed off with oil companies basically raping the land and, and gaining money from it, from their land. And, and not giving anything and back. And not getting anything back and the government's giving them bugger all. You know, they were desperately poor people but turned out very nice. <laughs> They were, you know, and they were desperate and poor, which is why they resorted to the extremes that they went to. Um, and in some way, they they outlined their intentions with you from early on. Yeah, right there and then, before we you know, we got out of the boat, and we we're like, "God, fucking hell, where the hell are we?" Uh, in this village, uh, a little bank, a little little beach. It's nice, actually, little <laughs> little beach, and then the village spread out. Uh, and they said, listen, there's a, we're not going to hurt you. We're going to take care of you because, you know, if you die, we don't get any money and we probably get an ass kicking as well for, 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 for allowing you to die or for killing you. And, uh, so yeah, they get, put us in a, in a hut. They gave us mattresses, mosquito nets, malaria tablets. They, uh, gave us three meals a day. You know, we ate with them basically. Um, and, uh, it was a case of, this is where you're going to sleep. Um, I'm not going to lock you up because you've got no idea where you are. <laughs> so you, good luck with the jungle. <laughs> uh, and they, they were really cool. So the, 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 this is where it gets comical, is water is more expensive than, than, beer. than beer. 
And uh, Nigeria, and well, it's not just Nigeria, but it was Nigeria that it really stood out for me. Is you get water in bags and peanuts in bottles. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that took me a minute too. <laughs> yeah, so um, water was more expensive, so they gave us there's, this Nigerian beer called Star Beer, which is very chemically heavy brewed, and it's just oh. It's disgusting. It's not even very nice when it's cold, to be fair. <laughs> other beers are available. Yeah, yeah, please. Do choose the other beers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> check out Fierce Beer. Yeah, I was going to say, check out Fierce Beer. Aberdeen Brood <laughs> Fierce Beer. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Star Beer then. Yeah. It was cheaper than water in Nigeria. It was then, yes. At that point, they said, you know, we need to keep the water for... A, and I was like, well, whatever. So we got... We drank star beer for nine days that we were held for um and it wasn't particularly cold so it was pretty it was it was quite rank oh yeah i got a sudden you know you get a a memory taste yeah (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah for nine days and and it was it was so chilled out actually the you know the shocker captures never are very nice and when we got kind of didn't trust them for the first couple of days really you know Half expecting to be full of shit and right. You're things sort of to just change. waiting for it waiting to be for, yeah ah, to here, get, to get the... nasty and it and it didn't and they would you know we'd sit and eat with them and uh, it's just it's just you know even now it's weird thinking back on it because it got so the state I, I could see the state of their weapons and I, they were in a shocking state so you know we would play football with the kids we do bits and pieces just to make ourselves useful because we're bored is there anything we can do to help because we're you know we've <laughs> got nothing nothing to amuse the time so or pass the time to stimulate your brain a little bit yeah it's mm-hmm. just so fucking boring so i i said look your your weapon what have you got to clean them with and i'm like okay so take take them take them the the rounds out the magazines unload the weapons so i serviced their weapons for them clean them up tidy them up sorted them out uh, same with all their magazines, cleaned everything up, got it all working smooth. Gave them some weapon training lessons, and just it's weird. You know, it was it was time time killing, time filling. But also the other side of it is playing on the safe side is the more human, more likable you can make yourself to your captors, the less chance there is of them wanting to kill you because they you build a little bit of a relationship with them. Yeah. It's not to say that they wouldn't kill you in a heartbeat, but it, it makes it less likely if you make yourself likable. So we made ourselves as likable as possible. Build rapport and keep your brain yeah, a little keep, bit sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, right. I mean, this will sound stupid, but if you're drinking just beer <sighs> for nine days in that temperature... Right, I, right. honestly. Were you drunk? Were you fatigued? Were you all yeah. the above? Yeah, Delirious? definitely. Uh, it's just, it was a steady level i wouldn't say we got drunk but the hangover once the beer oh god was it was the worst hangover i've had for for a very long time um normally people talk about how bad their hangover is and you sort of roll your eyes but i think with you a nine day kidnap in nigeria hangover yeah that sounds pretty bad yeah a nine day bender in the swamps of nigeria there we go yeah not not on the bucket list again and so when it came to be that you finally got released, mm. how long had it been and, and what did that look like? So we'd been there nine days. They woke us up one morning and said, okay, we've had a phone call. We're going to take we're gonna take you back down the river and, and let you go. And we, we, I think we were about an hour, hour and a half, something like that, going down the river. And then we got to, came around a bend of a river. There was a long straight stretch and another boat was coming towards us. It pulled alongside us. They dumped a big bag into our boat. We got into the boat that had the bag. We swapped over and they turned around waving goodbye. So we waved goodbye and then we went our way and then we were met at a jetty uh, and then taken away for a, for a debriefing. Why? And uh, the beginnings of a horrific hangover. Well, we kind of, we, we, we got debriefed, got showered and changed. And uh, back in Lagos. Um, and then we got taken out on the piss. <laughs> we went for a Chinese and got on, got on the lash in Lagos. 
I can't imagine that. Yeah. I mean, as as much as it sounds like they were very humane and actually they were, yeah, consider yeah. it. I still think that fear of what if would have probably eaten away at me to the point where I'd have become a problem. You know, I'd have been so I'd have been such a liability mentally in that scenario, conjuring up what's next, not believing them, becoming paranoid. I'd have probably made them kill me by accident by behaving so erratically. The thing about situations like that is you have to take it day by day, moment by moment. Um, every day could have been different. So you've got to you've got to make the best of the situation you're in. And it this is where, you know, lots of people create their own stress by trying to control what's going on around them. But we've got fuck all control of what's going on around us, really, in the grand scheme of things. What we have control of is this. When we control this, the rest of the body will stay calm. If we keep this in order, this will follow suit. It does what the brain tells it to. So if we can keep this in in good shape and keep it on an even keel, then we've got much greater chance of getting through difficult experiences, no matter what that is. It doesn't have to be as daft as getting kidnapped, but any stressful, highly stressful, or highly emotional situation, keeping this in check and keeping it, keeping yourself calm and on an even keel stops that emotional overload. Yeah, in the spiral. Yeah, because when we get when we get overly emotional, we start thinking and behaving and talking emotionally, and that generally lead, uh, leads to uh, a cock up. Yeah, bad outcome. We do something, say something that is not conducive to a good outcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And actually, that's something that we will talk about quite a lot in this podcast, you know, is what you've just described is a large part of what you're doing now. Absolutely. Um, but building up to that, it feels weird saying this, that was number one. Yeah. And that was, I think, you're probably comfortable when we saying that was the easy one. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a walk in the park, really, <laughs> on a summer's day. What was... With nice cold beer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that if that's the easy one, what happened next? What was what was the second one? The second one, there were myself and four others taken. Uh, and this was very different from the get go. We got beaten from the from the from the from the get go. Um, to make to make us compliant again into boats, up rivers. Uh, and we got there literally thrown out onto the onto the onto the shore and dragged really into a hut all five of us in one hut bare mud floor basic and they gave us one meal a day and one bottle of water a day and that was it and the food was there there i don't know who the chef was but it was shocking <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would say. The first one was great. The second one, I gave him a scathing review on TripAdvisor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do not go. Yeah. So, you see, th this began with a completely different tone from the outset. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, it was beatings and, and hostile, right? It was more vicious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was, it was, there was, it was uh, malice. I think would be a good word. Yeah. And this was in Nigeria again? Yeah, this is... Same part of Nigeria? Or yeah, yeah, same part. Yeah, that was... It was notorious. Well, it still is, to be fair. Why... After the first experience, why were you back there? Was this work again? Yeah, work again, yeah. And so... Yeah. I wouldn't go for holiday. No. Well, and you, I imagine you probably wouldn't work there again. No, well, they have to bloody... Well, no, I probably wouldn't go, but it would have to be an extortionate sum of money to even get me to consider it yeah mm -hmm. and so you get captured again this time you can feel the difference oh from the from the outset yeah what's the difference in your thinking at this point you fuck know, <laughs> what's the are you preparing yourself mentally differently this time are you thinking more like my kind of in the first scenario not to make light of it, but I probably would have overthought it to the point of getting myself shot. You know, I would have tried to grab the guy's gun from him, failed, and they would have just been like, this guy's a nutcase, get rid of him. But 
now you're in a situation where you're thinking this is not good. Yeah. To so the, the, with the first one on the, the you know the, the 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 moment of capture up until we kind of I would say the end of the or well, halfway through the, the 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 first day of being captured. You know, day one is captured. Day two is so halfway through day two, kind of got a sense of because they just left us alone. We we're like, yeah, well, do you need anything? <laughs> just whatever. Whereas this was the first lot didn't try and didn't beat us. They didn't do anything to us and capture. They tied us up and put bags of our heads. But apart from that, there was no physical contact as such. Whereas these guys were even in the boat up the rivers, they were kicking you or, you know, giving you a, a, a butt stroke with their AK-47. Which when, is charming. When you said butt stroke, I didn't know yeah, what that meant. Not, not buttocks, but the butt of the weapon and right. driving it into your back. Yeah, they weren't. They weren't. Well, that's what I thought. Stroking I buttocks or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I just don't think I would be caught for that situation. So, how are you starting to think this time? When they're doing that, are you thinking I need to escape? Yeah, yeah, but there's no, you know, again, it's always done in the middle of the night. Got no idea where the bloody hell you've gone. Right. You know, you bagged, thrown in the bottom of a boat and a speedboat and and taken up river for fuck knows how long. And then taken out, dragged out, thrown in this hut. How did the conditions differ this time? Basic mud floor, just a basic wooden hut. Um, Locked in? Yeah, locked in. Didn't get out of the hut apart from when they wanted to uh, beat the shit out of you. Right. Um, which, you know, we didn't get out of the hut. We had a, uh, they gave us a bucket to to use for, you know, we were basically pissing through the slats of of the, of this hut in one corner. Um, but the, we got a bucket to uh, to crap in. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, they would they threw food in. So most of the floor, went, the, the the food went on the floor when they dropped it in. So you're eating mud and shit and all sorts with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can imagine the state of the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and what what would the food be? And not it was just oh, it was just basic. There was it was there was pork and chicken, um, but just literally just like you know the the shitty scraps. Right. With with rice and a bit of slop. It was just but it was just one bowl. Mm-hmm. One bowl for the five of us. Um so slim pickings. Yeah. And it was fucking honking. It was disgusting. Um but their just their whole manner and attitude towards us was, was vastly it was cold, it was sinister, and it, it felt it felt very different. And it was even from the outset, it was just a very different feel to the, to the whole situation. And it was, so my, my mindset from the very beginning was, right, okay, this is not like last time. Right. I, need, I need to, I need to behave, I need to do things differently here. So I took it upon myself really, because nobody else had any military training. So I, I had, in order, because I could, a, a couple of the guys were kind of like, almost catatonic, if you like. Um, and everyone, you know, we were, I was shitting myself as well. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I had that advantage of having had training and experienced th- other things. It was despite shitting myself, I still kept myself together and kept calm in order to keep them, the other guys calm, so to get us through this situation as best I could. So I kind of took that responsibility to keep everybody else's state of mind in check as much as possible. And did these guys outline their intentions in the same way that the, the first set did? Or or did you have to figure it out yourself? I didn't speak to us. Oh. What were they after? Um, they were, it turns out, in, in hindsight, in, you know, in retrospect and finding out, it was uh, just criminal activity. They were just scumbags. So just for money and to just, be... Just money. They didn't give a fuck about the government yeah. and, uh, you know... Money and almost sadism. 
Yeah, yeah, they, 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 there was no, there was no warmth there at all. It was mm. just, and the problem being with this lot, because they were more of a criminal entity and a pretty, you know, pretty basic, they they were getting, you know, they were drunk every night. You could hear them up until all hours getting pissed. But as it dragged on and dragged on, it got to about 20 days in and they were getting really pissed off then that they weren't getting paid. So the last, yeah, the last couple of couple of weeks were pretty grim because they started taking us out during the day to give us a bit of a kick in, taking it out on us. They were getting more drunk. They were taking more drugs and they were clearly their their state of mind was clearly deteriorating as they were getting more angry uh, and they took their frustrations out on us. How did they do that? Uh, beatings um, for a few days. Then some, one of them up the ante, kicked one of the guys in the chest, knelt on him and stuck a barrel of an AK down in the back of his throat, and, uh, laughed in his face and pulled the trigger. But um, I knew he wasn't uh, pretty certain he wasn't going to kill him because he didn't have a magazine on his weapon. <laughs> but that could have mean didn't mean there wasn't one round one in the, the chamber. chamber. So... Um, but the fact that he didn't have his magazine, I always thought, actually, he's probably... Screwing with you. Yeah. Um, they were doing it with pistols, um, beating us with the the butt of a weapon, you know, smack you around the face with it or around the back of the head or the ribs, um, kicking you around. They dug a hole that was about, you know, just over shoulder width apart um, in diameter, uh, and it was about seven foot deep, and they'd tie your hands behind your back and drop you down the hole head first. And then these guys would uh, take great delight in using it as a toilet while you were down there. Charming people, you know. So mock execution, mock for ex lack of a better word. Mock executions, beatings. Degradation, yeah. the lot. Yeah, using you as a, as a human uh, toilet. Uh, and then it got... The, the, the bit that freaked most of us out the most was they, they were... At night when they were really tanked. They had these machetes with blades about that long and they'd whack you with it. And in their state, like it the was just flat side, the right? flat, yeah, the flat side. And it would just take a slight miss, a twist of the wrist. And, you know, you could have lost your, lost an arm or a leg or cut you wide open or cut your head off or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And when they're that drunk and erratic, you just don't oh, know. You hadn't, we had no idea. Yeah, they could have easily and just... And they're on drugs as well, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they don't do... Without, there I've got. I did share. Um, um, there was a French re, uh, reporter went to Nigeria, and I, I I saved the video. It was on YouTube. It was a YouTube short um, to share with people. Yeah, what it looked like. Yeah, I think I saw similar, that actually. That's a similar kind of. Yeah, the aggression and the the drugs and the alcohol and paranoia. Yeah, from them. Yeah, how how does that make you feel when you see a clip like that? On YouTube, does it does it take you back there or um, to a degree? Yeah, yeah, it kind of gives me the judders. I have to confess, mm -hmm. um, but nothing. Yeah, you know, I'm just I'm just glad I don't have to ever have to go back. Yeah, really, very relieved. And that is, I was going to say, a nice segue. That feels like the wrong word to use. That's an appropriate segue into. The third and, and final, hopefully final. Thank <laughs> fuck for that. The, the third and, and most it's recent. It's true, Johnny said it. <laughs> <laughs> the most recent kidnapping mm -hmm. was not in Nigeria. No. It was, now, when we did this at the live event, yeah. you know, a few months ago, I found it quite interesting to see a room. We had quite a diverse room, actually. You, uh -huh. know, you had people there from all different backgrounds, all different <laughs> countries, yep. a real mix. I find the reaction to this almost funny in that people sort of start to expect when you talk about capture, kidnap, mm -hmm. um, even trafficking, yep. a lot of people, there's a there's a stereotype that that mostly happens in Africa, you know, um, particularly Nigeria or Somalia, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. People sort of get that. When you turn around and say it happens to white people and by white people, you know, white Europeans, mm -hmm. 
there was an audible intake of air in the room as all the kind of, shall we say, middle and upper class white people in the room went, oh! Yeah. You know, and, and I'll admit it surprised me, but I think it's, there's definitely a misconception that this is only something that happens elsewhere. Yeah. So, you know, where where was the third kidnapping and how did that take place? Okay. Do you know the other, is the, the intake of air from from uh, the white people, but the Nigerians in the room were going, thank God we're not getting blamed for this third one. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that, you say that, there was actually a couple of friends of ours, yeah. like um, Pete and, and Edward, who are probably listening to this. Yeah. Were there and at that point? They were they funny afterwards. Up. They were so they were funny. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Got you. Well, it's not all us. No, it's and hilarious. In a strange way, and this is actually why I'm, I bring race into it because I'm not doing that for no reason. They, you could tell when you were talking about the first two, they almost have to go quiet and put their head down a little bit because I know, they, they yeah. feel remorse on behalf of obviously it wasn't them. Well, no, they feel shame. Wasn't <laughs> But, you know, they, they do actually, I think, feel a collective sense of shame that that's happening in their country, right? As any conscientious well, person yeah. would. Yeah, yeah. But what's funny to me, and this is why I'm bringing race into it, is that actually as white people, we often don't realise that we're as or more um, illicit in, the, in these things mm -hmm. than, you know, a Nigerian person is. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, it was quite funny to me because they were very sort of somber and respectful when you told that story. And a lot of the white people in the room and particularly the Europeans were sort of jovial, like, oh, of course, why would you go back there? Then when you got to number three, they were all humbled and they were like, oh shit. And yeah. suddenly, you know, they were like, you see, and it's kind of, I think we need to be mindful that actually, uh, not to make it about a religious thing, but the the proverb i forget what it is about throwing stones in glass oh, yeah. houses you know yeah, we, yeah. we really shouldn't be too quick to judge other countries and other cultures when we don't really know what's happening in our own backyard well yeah there's you know kidnappings happen all over the world um they happen in the uk um it's usually of high net worth typically right. uh you know the 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 the, the destination of of for kidnappings or well, the highest rate of kidnapping is Venezuela. Right. Um, Colombia is pretty good for it. Mexico. <laughs> but it's it's typically criminal activity. And it's typically for financial gain, right? Financial, yeah, yeah, yeah. Venezuela is, I think, the lowest uh, GDP country mm -hmm. in, on earth, I think. Um, I need to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's right down there as least well off financial country yeah. in the world um so that would make sense and and this is the thing you know i think it's all well and good to sort of make light of it and say of course it happens over there but actually you know yep. when people find out where the third one was it's on the opposite end of the spectrum it's a wealthy country um, yeah and predominantly you... white middle upper class people that drive expensive cars big houses and it's often held up as a country that we should aspire to be more alike. So yeah. I think it catches people off guard when they hear this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly Sweden is not the place you you tag with that uh, that label of of you know kidnap central. And it is a holiday destination. Sweden's you know. beautiful. Absolutely love Sweden. It's a fantastic place. And it, you know, this is not something that happens all the time in Sweden. This was you know, it was just because of the circumstances in which I was working in that this happened. Um, and is that something you're comfortable talking about? What was the, what was the circumstance, if you like, that caused it to happen? Well, I'll give it, I'll kind of, I'll give an overview, if you like. Um, I was working with a particular individual who had been trained in anti, uh, counter surveillance and anti surveillance. He'd become aware that he was being followed. He told me I did was checking and where this house was way out in the east of Stockholm in amongst the islands. Um, I did a confirmation around the back of this house through the woods. There was, there was a, at the bottom of the road, there was a car park and a cafe and there was a van there that wasn't usually there. 
nothing unusual particularly, but I was checking around the back of the house in the woods and there were two guys at the back of the house, both had weapons. I went back down to my car, which was parked at the other end of the car park away from this van around a building. Uh, as I got in the car on the phone, told my boss what was happening and to get him out of the house. Or, although I was going to get in touch and get him out of the house, I had to click off. I just clicked off the phone uh, and the van came screeching up the front and blocked my exit and guys either side with weapons hauled me out of the car, gave me a bit of a kick in, uh, took my phone, my jacket, my car keys. Um, but as a good boy scout, I had a spare set of keys secured under the chassis of the car just in case they didn't, you know, if anything happens, you know, you could lose your car keys all over the place, lose them in your own bloody house and can't see them for looking. Um, <laughs> Sounds I think familiar. that's more likely for yeah, me than, yeah. than the former yeah. <laughs> so they, they basically threw me in the back of a, a, a big transit van um, you know the long wheel base ones and there was a bench seat over each wheel so as I went into the back of the van I was on the left hand side there was a guy sat between me and the door and there was a guy be uh, between me and the front of the, the van although you couldn't actually get into the, the you know the cab um so, and I'm thinking they didn't cuff me, they didn't tie me, they didn't hood me, they didn't cover their faces. And I'm thinking these these guys clearly mean business. Uh, I need to get the fuck out of here. And I had no, I was, while we're driving off, I paid, was paying attention to the direction we went. So I knew where we were heading. Um, and I thought the quicker I get out of here, the good, the basic rule of thumb is if the sooner you can escape from being taken prisoner, the better your chances of escape. Why is that? Typically because you've got most energy at right. that point because you don't know what's going to happen later on. Um, you know where you are. You've got a good, you know, geographic to where you understanding were. of where you are. Uh, you're more likely to be nearer resources that you can get to that you know. So lots of things in your favour... Um, so I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to get out of this? And the only thing I could think of was I, as I was sat on the bench seat, the guy next to me, the muzzle of his weapon was tapping my right knee. So what I did was I leant forward to keep my head so I wasn't giving any eye contact, made myself look as much the grey man as possible and compliant and least threatening. And I tried to get as much saliva in my mouth as I could. And I, to this day, I don't know how I got any saliva in my mouth, to be quite honest. Um... And what I, I just adjusted, slowly adjusted my body position. So as my mouth was filling with saliva, I brought my right foot back, put my left foot slightly forwards. And as I was leant forwards, I got to the point where I think, right, it's shit or bust here. So I had my hands like that in front of me. I grabbed the muzzle of the weapon, just tapping my right knee, pushed it away so he could fire the, you know, I'd burn my hand with the, the muzzle getting hot from the rounds flying if you've started firing anything off but it was pointing at his mate. <laughs> so there was less chance. I lunged forwards, spat everything I had in my mouth into the face of the guy opposite. And then I drove this guy right to my right, hit him against the door with my other hand, reached round, I can't do it now, but reached over, flicked the latch for the to open the back door of this van. He fell out, I fell on top of him and his head hit, hit the deck and popped like a watermelon. Um, we rolled, um, I twisted my knee. I'd already, I, well, my shoulders now fused partly because of all this stuff, but, uh, dislocated my shoulder again. And I got up, hobbled into the woods and in the woods, it's like plowed troughs where there's these lines of trees. And I must've run about 60, 70 meters into the woods and taken a bit of a dog leg backwards and then laid in one of these troughs and just pulled snow and leaves all over me because this was early March and it was it was it was nighttime it was still snowing there was still traffic going up and down the road so they couldn't ha fortunately they couldn't hang about too long because they you know this is guy with the contents of his head all over the road um so they did a cursory search tried to find me couldn't and I heard him getting put in the back of this van and then they drove off but I waited there for an hour and a half to make sure that they had gone mm -hmm. um and I you know, occasionally peeking out. And then I made my way back to my car, which I hoped would still be there, and it was. 
Um, and I got the keys out and I drove back into Stockholm, went to my um, apartment, got on my laptop, got on Skype, phoned the boss. Uh, and he said, okay, we've, you know, the extraction plan has been gone to the hotel that, of his, so nobody knew, would know which hotel he was going to. So he chose the hotel and that was relayed back to me. And I packed all my stuff up, went and stayed in the same room as him that night. And the next morning we got a flight back to the UK. So, yeah, just one of those situations. I just, I just knew it was a one way trip. They were, they were going to take me somewhere and stick a bullet in my head and leave me in the, leave me in the woods. Did you ever watch Breaking Bad? No, I haven't. No, there's a there's a scene in that where um, I think it's Jesse Pinkman, um, played by Aaron Paul, who he's in a scenario where there's a couple of guys with like balaclavas break in, and um, it's someone he knows, and they abduct a the guy, threaten him, they've got guns and everything, and they basically are, I think they're trying to get information or money or something. Yeah, and um, they're trying to scare Jesse to prove that they'll kill this guy. Um, so that he's more compliant and does whatever they want. And um, Jesse's like a street dealer, kind of bit of a rookie, D doesn't really understand co criminality, things like that. But they get to a point where he has this breakthrough moment when these guys are really trying to intimidate him and make him believe they'll kill people. And he kind of says, you're not going to kill him. And suddenly he feels a bit untouchable because he says, you went to the trouble of hiding all of your identities, hiding your faces, wearing these balaclavas, um, putting a bag over his head so he didn't know where he was. You weren't going to kill him. Otherwise, you wouldn't have bothered with all of that. And this situation you're in, one is, is a real situation. It's not for TV, but it's the inverse. Mm. You're thinking they are not making any effort to hide who they are. No. This is a one-way trip. Yep. Kill or be killed, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that put the wind up me. I bet I don't actually have words for that. That's, I think that's one of those situations that that must push you to the limit of um, what a human can do. You know, that's yeah. You can be very creative under pressure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's to coin an old expression. It's uh, it's it's one of those moments where you find out that uh, adrenaline is brown and it does run down your leg. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. So you make it out of there, you get home. Yep. The first time you went out to the Chinese, went out on the strip afterwards. Yeah. What did you do this time? For that one, got home. Uh, actually, we were in, when we got to London, we were in the Mandarin, Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Knightsbridge, which is a very nice hotel. Uh, the guy got me very drunk well, and I continued to I went out. I'd been to hospital and I was on crutches. Um, well, one, because my left arm was in a sling because I dislocated my shoulder again. Um, so I had one crutch and a uh, and a sling. And, uh, yeah, went out and got more drunk. Typical military. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If in doubt, get shit-faced. And on that note, why... I'm going to put this bluntly because mm. I think you know what I'm getting at with this. Why didn't you become a raging alcoholic after this? Because that's what most people would have done, if not worse. You know what? How did you avoid that? Uh, I, I, th I just there's there's something in me. I just get I can, you know, I can enjoy a good blowout, detest the hangover, and you know, and and it's not, that's that's never prevented me from getting shit faced again. I just don't do it very often. But on that, I just don't, I get to a point where I just don't want to drink anything anymore. Right. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a natural cut off. A, a natural cut off. Yeah, exactly. I just get to the point where oh, fucking, I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. e you know, in that night or whether it's, you know, I'm like sometimes even at home, you know, I have one or two glasses of wine a night. The days when I'll just have a sip of that first mouthful of wine, I'm like that. No, and I'll put it back in the bottle. I can't. Yeah. You know, I can take it or leave it. Um, most of the time, I prefer to take it. <laughs> but you don't need it. 
No. And that's, I think, what stands out to me with you, because I'm trying to look at this from a what makes a person survive versus not. And my yeah. takeaways so far would be, number one, stay as unemotional as you can in those fight, fight the, or fight situations. Yep. Um, calmness is key. 100%. You know, if you can stop that chain reaction cognitively of panic, freak out, act, speak, yep. run, stay calm and think. Um, you know, the difference between me and that situation, I think, because thankfully I've never been in that situation, would have been hysterical. Try something stupid. Try and be the hero. Try and talk my way out of it. Something stupid. Outcome likely is I get shot. <laughs> <laughs> With you, it's quiet. The grey man the build rapport slowly but don't overdo it um think before you speak yeah you know less is more um but also then taking the time to think right i'll build up the saliva i'm gonna act quickly sooner rather than later and that composure i see a lot of lessons in that in far less extreme scenarios whether it's negotiation Absolutely. a job interview yeah stay calm and if you can stop that chain reaction, your chance of success or survival go through the roof. Absolutely. If you don't, they tank through the floor. Yeah, they do, yeah, because we'll say and do something that's completely out of normal character because emotion has taken over. Mm -hmm. And we think very, very differently when we're in that. Emotion leads us into, into survival mode, into fight or flight. And then we think and behave and talk very differently. And I think the other takeaway for me is... Well, there's two. One is not to live in that past experience. So if when you said you don't really have an emotional connection to this stuff now, mm. I think that's very rare. And it's certainly a hard thing to do. Uh, I think that's an understatement because trauma is complex, as, as you and I know. You know, trauma is not something you choose to let go of. But if well, we're talking oh, about... Oh, well, there you go. It's... <laughs> We can learn to let go of it. Yes, but it takes the learning. But it, but also there are people who just process it and not everyone hangs on to it. And so in terms of those traits that lead to survival versus non-survival, mm. destructive spiral, that's one of them, is either you, you can process and get beyond your trauma or you can't. Mm -hmm. And that's not, sounds a bit cruel to say it that way, a bit it's, cold. Don't know how. Some people just can't. But you can't can find a way. Can you teach someone that doesn't know? Yeah, of course you can. We yeah. can, we can all learn. Uh, there, there is. I firmly believe that there are a lot of people who have been misled, right? For the best of intentions, probably. But we don't. We don't. If somebody is experiences trauma, not everyone. Not everyone d grows and develops into PTSD. Some people do, some people don't. Don't really understand why particularly yet that's still being researched. There are some theories out there. Um, but for those who do get develop, it, for, it does develop into PTSD. PTSD, it's, you know, you kind of, it's, it's something that happens over time. It's, we, it's like, a, it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. It's unconsciously learnt and developed as a coping mechanism. But equally, if we can learn to do that unconsciously, we can learn to unlearn it consciously, consciously mm -hmm. and learn to do things differently and get ourselves back on an even keel. We will never be the same person we were before it happened. This is where people get stuck. It's because they try to become the person that they used to be because they want to be that person. You can't. Yeah. You have changed irreversibly because of what you've experienced. And it's about learning to become the next version of yourself, which is new and improved, wiser and stronger because of what you've learned and how you've learned to overcome it and to file it away. It's the emotion that's the problem. Mm -hmm. The memories themselves are not a problem. We have it's 80, the emotion attached to Yeah, exactly. We have up to 80,000 thoughts a day, most of which we're not bloody aware of. <laughs> And have no impact on our life. What we want is for those memories, those thoughts to come into our head and go, oh Christ, that was shit. Oh, what's for lunch? Yeah. Yeah, to, to pass over you rather yeah. than to take you. 
yeah, it'd have that momentary hit of, oh, I cannot remember that. That was crap. Didn't mm. like that at all. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm hungry. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody fancy beer? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a non-event when it comes through. I think that's, that's why I describe it almost as a rebirth for you with each of those experiences. You describe it as the next version of you that's grown mm-hmm. past that trauma. Yeah, and that's, yeah. that's probably a better way of putting it. Um, and I think the the third thing I picked up on there actually was just sort of maybe not having an addictive personality, maybe not being dependent on things. So if you use alcohol, drugs, or the wrong thing as a crutch mm-hmm. for a situation, you know, it's so easy to say all of this from the from the commentary box, you know, I'm not trying to minimize it because both of us have obviously had experiences and Mm -hmm. we certainly don't always cope. I mean, I, I had, um, PTSD as well. I've I've seen nothing even like what you've been through, but it's, it's, there is no comparison. It's very, it's, it's very subjective. Yeah. And it's entirely subjective. I am lucky that I got through it. Thanks to having just a good support system and good, um, good things to put my time and energy into like this yes. actually this is therapeutic um and it gives you a reason to feel like your life has value and, and fun um but now when i look at others i try to think what are they missing that leads them to think i'll fill that gap with alcohol i'll fill that yeah. gap with drugs and i don't necessarily know the answer um but if there's someone that might know the answer it's you or is, or is there no answer? Is there no one-size-fits-all approach to that? There is no one-size-fits-all, no. It's a very personal um, experience in terms of how you experience the trauma and how it's processed in, in your brain and your body, importantly. Um, and it's also very personal in, in what works for you. There are, uh, you know, umpteen different ways that people can utilise different methods to to help them you know process and overcome it and move on from it and leave it firmly filed away not you can't forget it but you can disconnect that emotion so that when you think of it it's not a problem you just you you remember it being crap but it you don't have that overwhelm of emotion which is what locks us into the past of when that thing was Mm -hmm. this is the thing is helping people to learn that there's a weird loophole in the brain with the brain in her processes stuff we can whether it's something we remember from the past something that's going on right now or something that we imagine might happen in the future we can't tell the difference in terms of how we feel about it it's whatever emotional label we've placed on it determines the feelings that we experience when that comes into our head yeah so we can use that to our advantage as well yeah and a lot of people self-sabotage oh. without knowing it God, by yeah. doing exa- exactly that. Yeah, but that's when people don't, because people don't know how to do it any differently. Yeah. When you show people how to do it differently and get them to experience it, it completely changes. Mm-hmm. Not straight away overnight that they're bang and it's that never happens again. Sure. But with consistent daily practice, people can learn to change the way they feel about these memories and these thoughts so that they can just get on with life and st- get back to living rather than just existing and yeah being stuck in the past yes and that sounds really rude and i don't want people to take it that way when i say stuck in the past but that's what people are doing it's yeah myself included you know i I say that not to be disrespectful to those people i say that as someone that was Mm -hmm. in that group of people um and actually that you touched there on you put emphasis on in your body Mm-hmm. And um, you reminded me of a really interesting conversation I had with a, a lady called Don Walton, um, a hypnotherapist and psychologist. And she was this wasn't on a podcast or anything. We were just we were just chatting. Mm-hmm. And, um, I feel the need to give her credit because she's written some brilliant books and she's very very intelligent and a great resource on the subject. As are you. And she was telling me about genetic memory, mm-hmm. um, which I'd never heard of. Didn't know it was a thing. And she told me that to prove this, there was a study done where they had rats um, or mice. I forget which animal, but animals, micey animals. Yes. <laughs> and uh, rodents, let's see. If, yeah. Are you allowed to say rodent? I don't that's even fine. know anymore. I think that's okay. I don't think they'll give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> they might have a memory of it, but anyway. <laughs> they had these mice or rats, right? And they put them in a in an environment where there was a buzzer 
and after the buzzer, they would be electrocuted. And over time, as you described, they associate the sound of the buzzer with what they think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so before the electric shock, they fear, anxiety, stress, all those kind of measurable things, heart yep. rate, blood pressure, etc., would go through the roof. Uh, they would die sooner, etc. They, they would be psychologically damaged by this experience, yep. including when the electric shock didn't happen, they just thought it was going to. Now, to most people with even a basic level of psychology, they'll know that and they'll think of Pavlov's dogs mm -hmm. and conditioning. Where genetic memory comes in, and this really blew my mind, is that they would then let those rats and mice, they would have a, a period where they didn't have any electrocution, they stopped and they never did it again. They would then conceive babies and have them all after the electric shocks. Ne they would never do that during or after the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then they'd play the buzzer and the babies would have the same reaction yes. anticipating the shock. And to reiterate, those animals have never had an electric shock or even yeah. been in conception while that was going on. Yeah. So the trauma and the fear of this thing was passed on genetically. Yeah. And that, I mean, that tells you a lot about if it can happen with animals, I believe it can happen with humans. It does. And that tells you a lot about how we might form things like alcohol dependent dependency yep. or uh, be more prone to things like PTSD, anything. Um, so I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but I thought when no. you mentioned in the body, that's... You're absolutely um, right. Transgenerational trauma. Yeah. It is passed down uh, through multiple generations. Uh, there's an awful lot of research on this. Uh, there's a particular field called psychoneuroimmunology. Bit of a mouthful to say. Um, but that very much uh, looks into the physical effects of what goes on in the mind and how it's expressed through the body. And and this, this is actually, we've sort of ended up here by mistake, but it's exactly what I was hoping would happen. Um, <laughs> we've got to the kind of neural area, right? And you and I were talking about this earlier over a couple of um, paninis that we spilled all over ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but um, actually something that I never got the chance to ask you about during the show, because actually, quite honestly, I didn't even know it about you. Um, because you're very humble and very, you're not a grandiose person. You're whatever the opposite is in a good way. You know, you're a understated. That's what I'm looking for. Um, I didn't know at the time that you are a doctor in psychology. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. Let me put it that way. But it's funny to me that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known that through, you don't shout about it. I would have picked up on it through the way you talk about psychology and people. Um, and I made the mistake of up until now or up until recently thinking that was because of your experiences. Okay. Um, I now realize and correct me if I'm wrong, those experiences were the catalyst for you to then go fully into psychology. Is that right? Yeah. I'd studied psychology before I did. I'd studied sports psychology and behavioral, um, and it got, it dripped the human intelligence work drove my interest kind of deeper into psychology, understanding how to manipulate people. <laughs> um, now I, you know, coaching, therapy, uh, persuasion, influence, negotiation, it's all manipulation. But what makes the difference is the intent behind it, is the intent behind the manipulation for my benefit or the other person's. Right. And that manipulation has a, has a negative connotation when it comes to interactions in relationships but you look at physical manipulation yeah like is very much very much for the benefit of the recipient sure um but equally you know you get put in stress positions or you get tied up like a pretzel um it's very uncomfortable and it's obviously not for the the benefit of you as the recipient so it's the intent behind the use of it yeah that's key. I think that's a good analogy, either um, being put in a stress position to mm -hmm. create pain and, and mm -hmm. strain um, to alter someone's mental state, yep. or like a chiropractor or someone like that, you know, realigning you to fix ailments. Yes. Um, 
And so that's a good analogy, actually, for what you do mentally. So psychotherapy, psychology, psychiatry without the pharmacology mm -hmm. is very much about a psychological manipulation to help you get better as the, as the, as the recipient. Uh, and ironically, a lot of the tools used to manipulate people for my benefit, for my aims, equally you can use to... I'll put it in plain speak for, for this is not my expression. This was somebody else's, uh, somebody described it as I used to fuck with people's heads. Now I unfuck them. Right. Which I thought was actually quite a good way of putting it. <laughs> the, uh, the other one that I really like is um, coming to me for therapy and or coaching. It was like having, going to Hogwarts and having a lesson in defense against the dark arts because it helps you to defend yourself against the dementors in your head. Right. Which I thought was a lovely description. I like that. I love Harry Potter. Um, and for me, actually, it was, weirdly enough, one of my things that helped me cope with PTSD and with okay. um, traumatic experience. So I do want to reiterate that to anyone listening to this, we've, we've talked about some kind of close to the bone stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're talking about trauma, drug and substance abuse, um, mental and physical abuse, torture, um, kidnap. You know, this is a pretty hard hitting episode. Um, but we do both very clearly respect those issues. And I just want to make that clear that we're actually not, neither of us are sitting here in judgment. We're actually sitting here trying to have a very open conversation. And yeah. part of that involves making light of the, of the dark stuff so as not to get sucked into it too badly. But also, I guess, just to keep this a, an interesting conversation that people can go, yeah, I've taken something away from that. Rather than if this was really depressing and sad, would probably be quite hard hitting, but it might not have the same. Yeah. We're actually trying to say, Hey, look, there, are, there are ways, you know, there are yeah. solutions to these things. Yeah. Yeah, um, there are. And everyone has to find their own way. And I would, you know, certainly advice I would give anyone who is struggling is don't, don't take what the system says as the gospel truth as to what's the right way for you. If it's not working, challenge it, ask questions and say, I'm feeling worse with this or I'm not getting it or I just think this is a load of shite. Yeah, yeah. Say and then, you, you know, go looking else, ask for for something else. Don't, don't just sit and think that you have to accept what's being offered. There's always other choices. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you, if, if they don't play ball, then go find help elsewhere. Yeah. And that's, I feel it's important to say that because it's easy, I guess, especially if you hear this out of context to think that we're kind of poking fun and saying oh, it's all in your head or it's all on you. We are saying that with the caveat that there's a lot out there for you. You're not alone. Yeah. And actually don't let anyone tell you that this is the complete and finished version of you. You're not, you are not your trauma. Um, you're not stuck there. And actually, we're not also saying that you're any less of a person for being there. No. Um, quite the opposite, actually. So just want to put that out there, that out of the, the two of us, neither of us think that way about people with trauma. We're quite the opposite. No. Um, and on the topic that we spoke about earlier with, um, you know, kidnapping and stereotypes, we're poking fun at that, actually, because our friends, our Nigerian friends in the room on the night, yeah. had the last laugh. Yeah. Um, because all of the naive people, myself included, went, whoa, Sweden? <laughs> it caught us off guard. Yeah. Um, so I would also just like to add, we're not making fun of the stereotype. We're making fun of people that were ignorant to what exists outside of the stereotype. Yeah. Um, plain and simple. You know, it's we need to be aware that these things are happening in our own country as well. And it's all well and good to say, hey, look over there, but just be mindful that you might get embarrassed or humbled when someone says, actually, where you live has X amount of this problem going on. And you go, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, and I would always, I just like to challenge the norm. I like to challenge stereotypes. And I think part of doing that is poking fun at, at Oh God, you could life, life's too bloody short. If you can't have a laugh at, Things that you got. I mean, look, I'm a fucking idiot. I got kidnapped three times. I mean, what kind of dickhead does that? Seriously, you know. But you know, on a on a 
to an aside from the, the lighter side, I totally get it because I've been at the point of suicide. I was going to stick a bullet in my head in 1997, 98. Um, so I've dealt with my PTSD with help. Yeah. And a lot of trial and error. It wasn't an easy, straight road. It was a lot of a lot of a lot of deviations mm-hmm. <laughs> and some backtracking. Yeah, it's definitely not a no a forward line, is it? It's, no, no, it's a forward, it, back, up, down, left, right. It's like sailing. <laughs> yeah, you got to tack and jibe. Uh, it's, you know? a, it's actually a, an even more apt analogy than you think because you need a team, you need support. You sometimes you even just yeah. need a bit of luck. Yeah, you know, the wind to go in the right direction and change for you. Um, and I guess the reason I'm saying that is I don't want people to come away from this thinking that either of us are like, oh, it's all in your head, it's all on you, it's easy, just change your mindset or get over your trauma. No, is it fuck? Neither of us think that for a second. Not a chance. Um, And I don't want people to think we think that because I know how much we both care about that. Um, But on that note, you know, I think it's worth talking more about what you're doing now and how everything we've just spoken about plays into your work today you know what are you doing now what are you working towards Mm -hmm. and um why okay so nowadays on the back of those three kidnappings i developed uh, a series of self-regulation techniques to help people manage their mental or psychological and physical state because if you control this this follows so if this is calm the rest of the system is and that's really important that's the foundation for for everything. To 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 be able to manage our emotional state, because without without if your emotions are all over the place, you're psychologically goosed. That's that's quite polite, actually, wasn't it? <laughs> for you, that's polite. I'm quite, yeah. I'm quite impressed with myself, actually. <laughs> I think goosed is the most safe word we've used on yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think you might be right. Um, so I developed this this process of self-regulation techniques, and it's grown, as things do, it's grown arms and legs over the last 16 years um, from 2007. And I now, I wrote a book about the process. I was teaching them face-to-face. That it was the driving force behind setting up a veterans mental health charity with a friend of mine uh, in 2017. Um, and... I've been teaching them face to face. I taught them over Zoom during COVID. And two years ago, I put them into an online platform. So they're all accessible online. Um, so there's different ways for people to access it. And online training is, no, you know, it's never the same as in the room where you've got that. You can ask questions, you get immediate feedback and you can tweak and test and adjust there and then. Sure. Uh, but it's a bloody good second best because People don't have the expense of, you know, they don't have to travel. They don't have to you buy. You can reach more people. You can, just with go, it. you can just go to your fridge and get dinner. You know, you don't <laughs> have to go to some bloody restaurant that's going to charge you a fortune mm-hmm. or hotel, you know. So it's just, just the whole point is to make it as accessible as possible. So now I teach this stuff. I teach, I speak uh, for, to companies and organizations about emotion and psychological resilience, which is the, the essence of my work based on all those experiences. Uh, I wrote the book on it and uh, I use it in coaching and therapy. In my coaching and therapy, the very first session, I teach every single person these three self-regulation techniques in the very first session so that they go away with a quick win, confidence boost, morale boost, that actually the remote control for this thing is actually in my hand. It's not in somebody else's. I am in control of myself. Because when people feel out of control, it's a very disconcerting place to be. But it's about the only thing we've actually got control of. <laughs> yeah, it's funny when you put it like that. That's very true, actually. We've um, we've had a couple of different, you know, subject matter experts in here yeah. now, um, producing their shows. So they're not all on our podcast yet. But I'll put some links if anyone's interested in the comments. One of them is uh, Dr. James McElroy, who was talking about. Um, microbiomes and the yes. gut microbiota oh, and things. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and actually, when you put it that way, that was very. It just clicked for me. What, with what he's talking about, we have no control over what's going on in here. Our body kind of self-regulates, but like we don't tell it to do anything. No, no. Um, 
actually the one thing we really do have some semblance of control over is is this. Yeah. It's just whether or not you realize you have control over it and whether or not you know how to take control yeah. over it. And that is massively simplifying it, but what you do in your work is explore that, teach people, enable people. And, and they're so simple to, to that I can teach them in half an hour. Right. And in that half an hour, that person, if I was teaching them to you now, in half an hour's time, you would have experienced them working because I explain them to you, then you use them. Right. So I am not I'm not therapying you. You are doing these using these techniques on yeah. yourself for yourself and you are yes that's exactly it it's about self-sustaining and self-maintaining mm -hmm. without medicine without medicine and we're not trying to shame people that take medication no there's we're a time and a place for everything yeah absolutely but even with medication people can still be emotionally overwhelmed yeah yes so this is for some people it's enough some people need both correct you know so it's horses for courses and you've got to find what works for you uh, and that's 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 a test and adjust. Everything is about test and adjust. Mm -hmm. And you might have to try lots of different things in order to find the way that helps you to move beyond and file it away. Yeah. So that's 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 what I do. I, you know, I work with individuals and I do a lot of corporate work. So my courses I teach to 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 companies. Um, there's a there's a kind of a a slightly hybrid way of doing things. So there's a bit face to face at the front with corporate stuff. Then they do the online course, and then there's a face to face at the end. Um, and the recent one was running a um, training course for the prison service down in England, um, which, fingers crossed, will grow some arms and legs. Mm -hmm. um, and where can people find you if they, whether it's for the corporate side or for the the training side? You know, I. I can picture someone listening to this thing and yeah, I would try that to learn those strategies. Yeah. Where do they find you if they want to do that? Uh, well, the easiest way I suppose is my website is simonmarion.com and I'm on, what am I, what am I on, on social media? Uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I think that's the only ones I use really. I got fed up with Twitter and binned it. What a <laughs> shit. <laughs> 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 oh god oh it just got sick of it you're not the first person to say that yeah. and i can see why so tiktok facebook and instagram mm -hmm. and it's my full name simon lee marion and marion is m-a-r-y-a-n that's it yeah mary with a short an <laughs> and so i guess to to wrap up what would your message be right now to anyone listening to this if you could give one piece of wisdom i'm thinking of your eggs of wisdom there ah the eggs of wisdom <laughs> if you Sorry, could give my wife's eggs of your wisdom. wife eggs of wisdom. that sounds weird um oh yeah that sounds we'll, we'll just give that context <laughs> if you want to know what we're talking about you can find them on simon's tiktok page yeah yeah um and i think instagram as well so if you're curious go and find out what we mean um yes <laughs> even if it's a joke if it's uh a one-liner, if it's a little statement that cheered you up this week, what what would you give as a message to the listeners? What's happened this week? Flipping heck. Um, cool, dear. What would you say to someone who's in a situation that they think they can't get out of right now? Yeah, there's so many things running my head just now. Um, in a situation that they think they can't get out of. Well, I, th I think this would be relevant for lots of people in lots of different situations, is pause. Before you open your mouth, before you do anything, pause, have a think about what's actually going on. Take a step back. Take a step back, take a step to one side. Take yourself physically out of that place where you were, where you were feeling like that and thinking like that. And have a look around and just before you do anything, even take a day, take a week to think about it before you take action. Sometimes you have to take action there in the moment. 
There's no denying that. But if you have the opportunity, pause, step back and have a think about what it is you need to say and do in order to create the best outcome. Don't allow your emotions to overrule you, to allow you going careering around like a mad bull. Yeah. Buy yourself some time. Yes. Don't don't put yourself in the position where you have to apologise and take both feet out your mouth. Mm-hmm. Well, not too often. Whether that's hitting send on an email, whether yeah, it's oh, yeah. how you respond to Save someone's those winding you up just now. Yeah. <laughs> I actually sometimes find if I'm unsure about whether or not I should send something, I'll schedule it for the next day and think, if I change my mind between now and then, I'll go and cancel it. Yeah, and yeah. nine times out of ten, if I'm, not, if I'm that uncertain, I do go and cancel it. And I'm yeah. glad that I gave myself that window too. Um, yes. And sometimes I wish I had the same thing with my mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's where keeping you know, pause before you speak. What I find as well is an extra an extra safety net because it's all too easy to click send by accident and send the email and then oh, oh shit <laughs> is write it in a word document. Yeah, or on your notes or something yeah, like that. And right? then if you feel you still want to send it, then copy and paste it in. Yeah, but, that makes sense. But it's that that's the pause. Pause take a step back and then have a think about what it is. What's the effect for you and anybody else by saying and doing what you were going to do? Mm -hmm. Is there ever a time where pausing is the wrong thing to do where you need to be decisive and act now? Uh, Yeah. If you're, if you're uh, under attack in some form, yes, absolutely. You know, there's no time to waste. End it as quickly as possible. (laughs) <laughs> and when there is no more threat stop yeah don't go overboard whether that's physically or verbally or whatever mm-hmm. but put an end to it as quickly as possible but the first and foremost do your utmost to not get yourself in those situations in the first place best form of defense is to not be there yeah <laughs> i like that that's it that's gonna be my quote from this wouldn't it? yeah best form of defense is to not be there in the first place yeah Simon, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Likewise, mate. Cheers. (laughs) See you in the next one. Cheers, Johnny.